Well, hello, church history friends. My name is Barb Walden, and I thank you for joining us tonight as we explore the fascinating life and legacy of Anne Dawson, the first woman baptized into the Latter-day Saint Church in England. I'm also thrilled that Robin Spears is with us and sharing her latest research about Anne. Also joining me are two of my favorite co-hosts, Peter Smith and Wendy Eaton. Uh, Peter serves as a board member for the Historic Sites Foundation, and Wendy serves as the administrative assistant for the foundation, as well as the assistant archivist for Community of Christ and Independence. Uh, welcome back, Peter and Wendy. Now, friends, there's no way we could host lectures like tonight's program without your generous support. And if you're looking to give, let me do a screen share on the ways that you can give. Your donations go to developing new educational resources. Uh, they fund the Alma Blair Internship Program for young adults learning history. They support the expansion of oral history records, and they ensure that we can continue providing online programs like our lecture series and book series long into the future. Uh, you can see the QR code on the screen, and Wendy will drop the online do donation link and mailing address into the chat. Uh, thank you all for helping support and preserve church heritage, not only at the historic sites, but also in creating these new educational resources. Uh, we appreciate you. And as I shared earlier, we are excited to welcome Robin back to our online lecture series. Uh, earlier this year, she shared, shared the story of the first woman baptized in Tubuai, and tonight she's here to share the story about the first woman baptized in England, uh, Anne Dawson. Now, Robin is a PhD candidate in history at the University of Arkansas. She's lectured at the University of Arkansas and at Brigham Young University and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints History Department Roundtable, as well as the Arkansas Institute of Religion. She serves on the John Whitmer Historical Association Article Awards Committee and as an institute teacher at Rogers State, as an institute teacher and the Rogers State Communications Assistant Director for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So welcome, Robin. I'll hand the spotlight over to you as we are all ready to learn more about Ann Dawson. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, again, thank you, Barb. I'm super happy to be here. I feel it uh, an honor and a privilege to be with you all. Um, this bucolic image that we're all looking at is the River Ribble in Lancashire, England. And again, I want to start by thanking Barb Walden for the privilege and opportunity to present to you my recent discoveries about Anne Dawson. I knew during my master's here at the University of Arkansas, the, through a series of uh, spiritual manifestations that I needed to research Latter-day Saint women for my doctoral dissertation. When I read the introduction to the first 50 years of Relief Society, healing that the women performed jumped off the page at me. So when I dug a little deeper, I learned that women in England and the Tahitian Islands performed blessings of healing. So that's how my interest began. And uh, But my interest grew deeper when I learned about the consecration that these women performed during their mortal ministries. So as I prayed about what to share with you about Ann Dawson, the words show and tell from kindergarten kept coming to mind. So we're going to do a show and tell. Uh, several of the most important historic documents about Ann Dawson, the first woman baptized in Europe, is what we're going to look at. And just a little spoiler, since this audience is primarily members of the Community of Christ, descendants of Ann Dawson joined the reorganized church as early as the 1860s in St. Louis, Missouri. So we will conclude with those documents from the organi reorganized church, which I hope our Community of Christ friends will appreciate. Here's the first show and tell, Patriarchal Blessing Index. Let's begin with Dawson's birth. Here, uh, this shows that her birthplace is in Chipping. While I've been unable to procure the actual Patriarchal Blessing, only her direct ancestors, I mean direct descendants, can gain access to that. 
this index thinks, thankfully gives her birthplace and birth year and the date of her patriarchal blessing. She likely spent her childhood in Chipping, Lancashire, um, but we don't find her in records again until we see her marriage record. Here we see that she was married at the St. John's Parish Church of the Church of England in April of 1811, which means this was a shotgun wedding because she would have been seven months pregnant with their oldest daughter, Elizabeth. Here are the baptismal records of two of their daughters. You see the top one is Alice and the bottom one is Margaret. Margaret is one of the reorganized church members in Missouri um, later on. But you'll see that <clears throat> eventually the baptismal records started listing occupation. You'll see on the right hand side of the screen, block maker block maker in both Alice and Margaret's baptismal records. This lets us know that um, we found the right John Dawson. So he lists block makers for, for, for his, as his profession. So a note on the town of Preston. From 1810 to 1830, Preston, England's population uh, about exploded sixfold not unlike the Dawson family. This population explosion was due to the labor opportunities in the mills. Dozens of mills in Preston belched black smoke. Charles Dickens visited Preston in the mid 19th century and it's believed that he used Preston as his inspiration for the fictitious town of Cokeville in his novel, Hard Times. Uh, having visited Preston himself in February 1854, Dickens was an eyewitness and detailed the town in his usual descriptive prose. Dickens recorded, it was a town of red brick or a brick that would have been red if the smoke and ashes had allowed it. It was a town of machinery and tall chimneys out of which interminable serpents of smoke trailed themselves forever and ever and never got uncoiled. Inside these mills, women, men, and children all work together. Children as young as four worked under the machinery as scavengers, picking up pieces of cotton that fell on the ground. Um, a note on block making, John Dawson would have created the wooden blocks used for calico printing in the mills. While most families scraped by barely surviving, it's clear that the Dawson family was successful in moving up economically. While they're seen living in the stable yard in 1818, they move from Bleasdale Street to Albert Street, which is adjacent to Vauxhall Road, um, which comes into play later, then to the famous Pole Street home, where the first Latter-day Saint missionaries would set up church headquarters for Europe. In 1835, John passed away. This is a pivotal time for Dawson because she not only gains an inheritance from John's passing, but she, let me see if I can shrink this screen. There we go. Uh, she not only uh, gains an inheritance from John's passing, but she also gains a new faith community with her nonconformist fellow believers in Reverend James Fielding's Vauxhall Chapel. As she sat in the pews with three un other adherents to the Reverend James Fielding's teachings, her pastor began reading letters from Canada from his siblings, Joseph, Mary, and Mercy. Now, I think it's important for us to understand that frequently we talk in church history about people from the day that they're baptized as though they didn't have a life before their baptism. <clears throat> I think it's very important when we talk about the early convert to explore their life before because that helps us understand why they might have chosen conversion. And for Anne, she listened to her pastor's letters from America where she learned about Joseph Smith and she learned about the Latter-day Saints. <clears throat> While in Toronto, her Reverend James Fielding siblings, Joseph, Mary, and Mercy, had heard from a Latter-day Saint missionary named Parley P. Pratt. They adopted this new faith then called the Church of Jesus Christ with its miraculous gifts of the Spirit. 
that accompanied baptism and receiving the Holy Ghost during the confirmation. Dawson grew interested and wanted to hear more about this faith on the other side of the pond. And it was here in uh, this Vauxhall Chapel that the first missionaries preached at 3 p.m. on Sunday, July 23rd, 1837. Uh, Dawson was surprised to see American missionaries in attendance that day. At James Fielding's conclusion, he announced that a Latter-day Saint elder would preach in his chapel at three o'clock that very afternoon. And news of the novelty of an American preaching in a Preston chapel spread quickly. The first missionary to speak in the meeting was American Heber C. Kimball, and he testified to the British audience, quote, that there had been an angel visited, that there had an angel visited the lower regions and committed the everlasting gospel to man, and he prevailed upon them to repent and prepare for his second coming and laid down the way for them to enter into his rest. <clears throat> Dawson and others responded enthusiastically. Kimball recorded, they cried, Glory to God, to think that the Lord had sent his servant to them. Confiding in a letter to his wife, Kimball noticed that this caused the people to stare at me and that the converts, including Dawson, dated their conviction back to that time. Joseph Fielding, a fellow observer of Kimball's sermon recorded in his diary, there were many of them sincere and willing to know the truth. They were much interested, according to Joseph Fielding. There does not exist a firsthand account of Dawson's reception of the first Latter-day Saint sermon. However, one of Dawson's fellow adherents, George D. Watt, recalled about that first Sunday meeting. I then knew that they were the true servants of the Most High. Before they had opened their lips to say a single word in my hearing, I was with them both in body and spirit and was ready to stake my earthly all and even my life on the truth of their testimony before I had heard it. Wah also recalled, my body was filled with light, even the light of Christ. <clears throat> the following Sunday, hundreds gathered at the water's edge at the River Ribble to watch the first nine get baptized. 48-year-old Ann Dawson was the first woman. Her son-in-law, Miles Hodges, was also included in the nine, making it an extended family affair. This event of the baptism was highly triggering for the Reverend James Fielding. He had purchased a place for a new chapel, and this loss of his best of his flock was very painful for him. He closed his chapel doors and his home to the missionaries, and Dawson, mindful of the homelessness of the American missionaries, offered her home right here on Pole Street to help house the missionaries. Willard Richards and Joseph Fielding moved in with her. The following week, on August 6, 1837, the first branch in Europe was organized under Dawson's roof, cementing Dawson's Pole Street home as one of the most sacred spaces in church history in Europe. Today, that congregation still meets as the longest continual congregation in the Restoration. Dawson's home would continue to bless the saints for another decade. Over the next year, both Richards and Fielding would court and marry Janetta Richards and Hannah Greenwood, respectively. Babies Rachel and Ellen Fielding were born on, Janu on June 27, 1839 and February 9, 1841 on Kirkham Street, respectively. Evidence suggests that it was Dawson who acted as sanctioned anointing midwife and priestess for both the births. Richards had trained in New England in Thompsonian medicine in which they practiced a new form of medicine in which nature and herbs were a sufficient apothecary. It was an alternative medicine to certain poisons and bleeding that most physicians prescribed at that time. In addition to Thompsonian medicine, missionaries and early converts also preached a need for women's blessings of healing. While we don't have an exact description of what those anointing blessings looked like, in the 1830s, we do know 
what they looked like in 1876. <clears throat> One record describes how eight women fasted and gathered in a home to heal a sister with a speech problem. Marianne Burnham Fries described the healing ritual. She wrote, they had washed Sister Young preparatory to having her anointed, which ordinance I attended to after we had prayers. Sister Lawson, being mouth, made an excellent and humble prayer. Then I called Sofa to seal the anointing, which she did in a praiseworthy manner for one so young. Then I called upon Jane to anoint the head of Sister Wickens and Sister Newson to administer to her. They both did exceedingly well. I will here mention that we all laid our hands on when each one was administered to. Then it was proposed to bless Sister Louis Felt, she being poorly, Sister Cushing anointed, and Sister Lawson blessed her. After we were through with these, Sister Aggie Tuckett, who was very sick, sent a word for us to come and pray for her. We went in, and Lizzie Felt anointed, and I administered to her. Felt that they all would soon be healed. They were so grateful to us, seemed to look upon us as ministering angels. According to historians Jonathan Stapley and Christine Wright, Freeze's diary entry showed how healing rites created social networks. Like Freeze's community, Dawson's Preston community also created social networks through the need and desire for healing rituals. Not all births and blessings turned out successfully. Dawson's own daughter, Alice, died on September 2nd, 1838, following the birth of a baby girl, while under Dawson's care. Dawson had dismissed the attending physician, Dr. Spencer, since according to this Preston Chronicle article, she, Dawson said, the Lord's work and the doctor's work would not agree. This was such a blow to the attending physician, Dr. Spencer, who had been dismissed, that he complained to the police. It must have been a frightening day when Dawson was summoned to the mayor's court with the charge of manslaughter. Dawson ran the risk of being on the remand or time in prison. On October 3rd, 1838, Richards and Dawson entered town hall to answer the charge of murdering her own daughter. This must have been an intimidating, humbling experience for the old widow. The town hall sat adjacent to the marketplace, the center of the commercial and polit political life of the town for over a thousand years. The town market served many outlying towns in Lancashire. A solitary obelisk stood erect outside, a column erected in 1782 with a gas lamp placed atop it in 1816. After entering the town hall, both Dawson and Richards were placed at the bar charged with causing the death of Alice. The prosecution made their case first. The prosecution had to show a case to answer. It was what was called a committal hearing. If it was too weak, the magistrates would dismiss the case, the case entirely. Dr. Spencer voiced his accusation. Richards and Dawson took Alice out of appropriate traditional medical care and practice, quote, highly improper medicine that resulted in Alice's demise. Spencer defended his own medical treatments, testifying that Alice was doing well, her symptoms gradually abated, and the patient was in a fair way of recovery. According to Spencer, that all went awry when Alice dismissed him in favor of her spiritual advisors. These backwoods medical treatments included the ingestion of cayenne pepper, a typical Thompsonian prescriptive for restoring heat to the body, ginger tea, and rubbing the body with rum. Another witness complained that Alice requested Richards give her his black stick to be placed in her bed with her. Even more irksome to the plaintiffs was the fact that the priests of her sect prompted Dawson to assume medical care of her daughter. Spencer concluded that these treatments aggravated the malady of the patient, and after a few days, the poor woman expired. Following the prosecution's testimony, Dawson defended her actions. 
when attacked for being prompted to assume medical care by the priests of her sect, Dawson replied, referring to Spencer's traditional treatments, the Lord's work and the doctor's work would not agree. She went on to justify that the remedies she had administered were more proper than Spencer's. When Richard's quiz questioned, he responded that his role was simply spiritual and nothing medical. The judges listened as both the prosecution witness and the defendant's testimonies went on at great length. At the conclusion of the trial, a certain Mr. Bannister concluded, quote, the Mormonites were carrying on a most dreadful system with regard to sick people. Their object was to dispense with the attendance of medical men altogether, and they appointed a number of midwives who were under their special tutorage. However, the magistrate determined that the case was not strong enough and liberated Dawson and Richards. As you can see right here on the screen, Alice's death certificate recorded, she died of a cold. Three separate sources reported this trial. The local newspaper, Fielding's Diary, Joseph Fielding's Diary, and the church's newspaper years following the event. The Preston Chronicle article began with the startling accusation. The title was, A Serious Charge Against a Mormonite Priest. The journalist described Richards as a grave looking parsonage and an elder in the Mormonite sect. Dawson was described as, quote, one of his flock, mother of the deceased and a deluded parent. According to Fielding's journal, enemies of the church seized this opportunity to arraign Richards and Dawson before the mayor's court. Fielding wrote, we have just come from town hall where we have been to hear Brother Richards and Sister Ann Dawson, our old housekeeper, answer to a charge of having aided in killing Alice, her daughter, because we took her out of the hands of the doctor. But our enemies were disappointed. This was an attempt to condemn Brother Richards. This was suffering for pure righteousness sake. Almost two and a half years later, the Latter-day Saint Millennial Star published a paragraph rebuttal titled Mission to England or the first foreign mission of the Latter-day Saints. Quote, Sister Alice Hodgen died at Preston on the 2nd of September 1838 and it was such a wonderful thing for a Latter-day Saint to die in England that Elder Richards was arraigned before the mayor's court at Preston on the 3rd of October, charged with killing and slaying the said Alice, with a black stick, etc. But it was discharged without being permitted to make his defense as soon as it was discovered that the iniquity of his accusers was about to be made manifest. In the church's newspaper version of the trial, the Millennial Star, Dawson was glaringly missing from the trial. There is no evidence of the case in the quarter sessions of Lancashire or the assizes in the National Archives, which proves how quickly Dawson's case was ultimately thrown out. This case was dismissed and never made it to the assizes. Dawson was undeterred by the unanticipated tragedy of her own daughter's death. Perhaps Dawson felt emboldened by her victory at Town Hall. Because it's clear that by December of that year, just a couple of months after the manslaughter trial, Dawson was out and about performing more anointing blessings of healing, with Willard Richards acting as witness. This is Joseph Fielding's diary entry. He said, Afterwards, Dawson went and anointed the sick sister who was much better. Brother Richards was witness to this. In April of 1830, three of the first four presidents of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints sat at Dawson's kitchen table. Brigham Young, John Taylor, and Wilford Woodruff. Apostles George A. Smith, Parley P. Pratt, Orson Pratt, and Heber C. Kimball also joined this first meeting of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles 
outside of North America. In Willard Richards' room, the brethren ordained Richards to the apostleship and received him into the quorum. Richards prayed during his ordination. He, he wrote, Oh my God, I ask thee to enable me to execute the duties of this office in righteousness, even unto the end, with my brethren the twelve, that we may even be the, of one heart and one mind in all things to be formed of thee in thy kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Dawson's spiritual, temporal, and ecclesiastical support must have given the brethren some ease, hoping that future missionaries would have the same welcome in Dawson's mission home. Outside of housing the missionaries and growing their families and purchasing and preparing meals for her boarders, Dawson also grew to be an authoritative figure in member retention. With hundreds of converts and a lack of leadership from 1838 to 1840, many fell into apostasy. Dawson's family were not exempt from such behavior. Only days after receiving her own patriarchal blessing, Dawson joined Fielding and Kimball in a church disciplinary council at a Burnley sacrament meeting on Sunday, June 21st, 1840. After the visit of the apostles to Preston, a church disciplinary council resulted in the re-baptism of Dawson's eldest daughter, Elizabeth Dawson Shorrock Cottom and Dawson's son-in-law, John Cottom. This, that Sunday morning, Fielding and Dawson attended the rebaptisms, possibly along the Burnley Embankment. According to Fielding's diary, Elizabeth had got married as it was considered unlawfully, having a husband living, and at the time of the wedding, they were not so faithful as they should be. After their rebaptism, Dawson felt much grieved for their adulterous behavior, being linked to such sinful behavior by her own daughter, and as a matriarch in the community, Dawson experienced a devastating blow. Fielding empathized with Dawson. He pronounced the title of Mother in Israel on Anne Dawson. The title Mother in Israel carried deep significance for the founding women of the early church. It meant so much to Lucy Mack Smith mother of the founding prophet Joseph Smith, that Brigham Young put the title to a vote at a church conference in Nauvoo, to which the congregation responded, yes. With the title of Mother in Israel, Lucy's efforts in the foundation of the church were validated. Similarly, Dawson's recorded title of Mother in Israel by the British mission president must have had some significance to Dawson. Regardless, Dawson is the only person given the title Mother of Israel in the many daily entries of Fielding's mission. Some historians have incorrectly supposed that things ended badly between the missionaries and Dawson. This is untrue and likely a haphazard misreading of primary sources. Two years after calling Dawson a kind mother, mission president Fielding called her mother in Israel after including her in this church disciplinary council. There is an erroneous assumption that, again, the things ended badly with Dawson and the missionaries, but there's no evidence of this in the primary sources. Quite the contrary. We find her living here on Kirkham Street with the Fieldings in the 1841 census. In 1840, she wrote an endearing letter to the youngest apostle, George A. Smith. She wrote, I want to know when you are going back to America and if you interest to come to Preston again before you go. I feel quite ready to go as soon as the Lord opens my way. Please pray that God may open it soon. I long to be off from this place and fulfill the commandment of the Lord in gathering with the saints to the place which he has appointed. 
Dawson's letter reflects the urgency she felt to gather with the saints in America. She believed that Nauvoo was a spiritual attraction where the prophet of the restoration lived. She believed that the imminent millennial reign of Christ would commence in the land of Zion, the new Jerusalem in America. While the escape from poverty motivated most British subjects to leave their homeland, this was not the case for property-owning Dawson. She wrote, I love to serve the servants of God. I should wish to do so till the Savior comes, and there to wait on him if he should count me worthy of such an honor. Do you think I shall? The work of God is going on well here. We feel very comfortable. Some are baptized every week. I do rejoice in the work of the Lord. I was the first female that was baptized in this land. Many said I was a fool, but I feel that I have chosen the good part, and no one can deprive me of it if others reject it. It is because they don't know what it is. The best way to know what it is is to try it. I know it to be the truth of God, the greatest blessing that God ever blessed me or my family with. And if others do not know it, we do. And bless God for it. And there is great joy among the saints here. They do rejoice as well as myself. I long to see all the honest in heart gathered together into the new and everlasting covenant. I know these things must be done in spite of all the power of Satan or men. Dawson knew that she was skilled in the art of hospitality. Between her childhood and chipping and her family life in Preston, Dawson perfected those Victorian skills while caring for missionaries and apostles in Preston. She also wanted it documented on paper that she was the first female that was baptized in this land. This timely title as first augmented her authority and value to the church in building up Nauvoo. Her impact in the practice of women's blessings of healing was influential in the Nauvoo culture, likely influencing Joseph Smith's April 28, 1842 sermon to the Relief Society. After Dawson's success, women's blessings of healing, and that's Willard Richards sitting down right there behind Emma, after Dawson's success, women's blessings of healing in Nauvoo grew in popularity. Pioneering Latter-day Saint women believed that God led them in caring for the sick. The prophet, President Joseph Smith, believed in the propriety of females administering to the sick by the laying on of hands and clarified the fledgling church's policy when he taught, if the sisters should have faith to heal the sick, let all hold their tongues. President Smith's successors, Brigham Young, John Taylor, and Wilfred Woodruff, all supported the sisters in this religious healing ordinance. These women uniquely cherished the spiritual gift of healing. So much so, the phrase, bless the sick, sat atop the other missions, of the female arm of church leadership called the Relief Society. Two and a half years after Dawson wrote her letter to George A. Smith, her words achieved the desired effect. The Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in Nauvoo voted to bring Sister Anne Dawson and her family over from England. You can see that at the bottom they said, be brought over to this country. The May 23, 1843 minutes from the quorum's meeting are the only known primary source originating in Nauvoo, World Church Headquarters at that time, that mention Dawson. Such commanding votes like this were usually reserved for members of the church who had skills or attributes to help build the church in Nauvoo. Joseph Smith exhorted the Twelve to encourage both the factory worker and the saint with substance to emigrate. Dawson would have been the latter. It may be that the Twelve knew of Dawson's property ownership and claim as the first female baptized in Europe. After all, most of the apostles had spent that sacred time in Dawson's home for 
Richard's ordination. Notwithstanding the church sponsoring her voyage to America, Dawson remained in England. News likely reached Dawson about the vote during the summer of 1843. Her daughters, Mary and Margaret, did choose to embark on their voyages across the Atlantic to America. They were each married in Missouri by 1846. On March 11, 1844, Dawson set her things in order, giving all her estate to her eldest nephew, John Dawson. Dawson's will reveals that she not only owned one home on Pole Street, but two properties. Three months after filing her will, Joseph Smith, the church's founder and prophet, was murdered on June 27, 1844. Janetta Richards wrote a letter home detailing the tragedy. Willard was in Carthage jail when, with Smith when the mob attacked the building, shooting Smith and his brother Hiram Smith and Apostle John Taylor. Taylor miraculously survived, but Joseph and Hiram perished. Dawson likely found out the news through Janetta's letter home. A year later, on July 9, 1845, Janetta Richards, for whom Dawson had cared for years, also died in Nauvoo, Illinois. With the loss of both Joseph Smith and Janetta Richards, reasons for making the dangerous journey to Nauvoo began to pale. The marriages of Dawson's two youngest daughters in America may also have given Dawson a sense of well-being about staying in England, knowing her daughters were provided for. On September 3rd, 1849, Anne Dawson passed away in her sacred space, the Pole Street home, unheralded and uncelebrated in any church publications. Dawson's daughter-in-law, Jane Dawson, signed Anne's certificate as the witness and was present at the death. Preston maps show a timber yard right next to Pole Street in 1849, so Dawson did not go in a quiet, contemplative space, but she was surrounded by her community of family, something that would not have happened in Nauvoo. Jane's one-year-old daughter, Margaret Dawson, passed away the same week. Anne Dawson was buried on September 27, 1849. The size of the pomp and circumstance accompanying her Victorian funeral procession is unknown. As Dawson did not leave a journal behind, historians can only speculate as to why she never left England. Even if she had joined her daughters in Missouri, the 1849 cholera epidemic might have killed her. Her young former son-in-law, Miles Hodges, made the journey and perished after only being in Nauvoo for a few days. It's possible Dawson wanted to stay in Preston with family. Dawson's eldest daughter, Elizabeth, and her husband, John Dawson, remained in England. They did not make the Atlantic journey until 1864, 15 years after Dawson's passing. The news of polygamy in the church did not stop people from emigrating from England to America. Emigration took off in the 1850s, right when Brigham Young publicly declared the practice of plural marriage. Dawson may have felt that her power was in Preston. She was the evangelist in the area, she could have been scared by the physical journey or the culture shock of America. According to, to correspondence from Nauvoo to Preston, held in the Lancashire Records Office, Nauvoo was radically different from Preston. She may have seen her place as at home in Preston, spreading the word. According to her descendants, Dawson was strong enough in her faith to be the best person to evangelize in Preston. She could literally speak the language. In that context, she could do much better in Preston as people admired her there. When missionaries for the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints arrived in St. Louis in 1864, Dawson's daughter Elizabeth was the first female baptized in St. Louis. Elizabeth's husband, John, was one of the first RLDS baptisms as well. Both John and Elizabeth Cottam knew of Dawson's hold on the title, and they informed local leaders. In a letter published in the True Saints Herald, missionary E. Robinson wrote to our LDS church authority, Brother Sheen, quote, 
Brother John Cottam, who is among the first of those who embraced the faith in England during the mission of elders Kimball and Hyde to that country. The first baptisms took place in Preston. As I understood Brother Cotham on a Sabbath in 1837, when his mother-in-law, Anne Dawson, and some others were baptized, and he himself was baptized the Wednesday evening following. I also saw Sister Elizabeth Dawson Cotham and others who were among the very first to embrace the faith in that land, all of whom feel to rejoice in the glorious liberty of the gospel, but who repudiate the pernicious doctrine of polygamy, which is taught and practiced by Brigham Young and his adherents in Utah. St. Louis Baptismal Records, RLDS Records, confirm that Elizabeth Dawson Cottam was indeed the first female baptized in St. Louis for the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Dawson's children who immigrated to Missouri are Elizabeth Dawson Shorox Cottam, John William Dawson, Mary Dawson Dreps, Margaret Dawson, McDaniel McClellan, and Samuel Bailey Dawson. Dawson's daughters, Anne Dawson and Alice Dawson Hodgson, both passed away in Preston. Anne Dawson and her descendants are absent from histories developed in Utah and Idaho. Whether that is due to her family joining the Josephites and not the Brighamites remains to be determined. Dawson's daughter's 1877 obituary provides further support for Dawson's claim, published in the St. Herald, the article declared, quote, Sister Cottam was the first woman baptized into the reorganized church in St. Louis, and her mother, Sister Anne Dawson, was the first woman baptized in England in the early days of the church. She died strong in the faith, and we hope to meet her in the morn of the resurrection. Dawson's claim as the first female baptized was not lost to the St. Louis RLDS saints. The claim appears again in a 1934 Saints Herald obituary, possibly in response to Latter-day Saint Spencer Kimball's 1925 claim that Elizabeth Walmsley was the first woman baptized in England. The 1834 obituary declares, John E. Dawson was born at Preston, England. He came to the United States with his parents and brother in 1864. His grandmother, Anne Dawson was the first woman baptized into the original Church of England in the city of Preston by Elder Joseph Fielding when the missionaries went to the British Isles in the days of Joseph the founder. While this obituary erroneously declares Fielding and not Kimball the baptizer, it does echo other reliable sources that Dawson deserves the claim to the title. Even Orson Whitney's 1888 biography of Kimball did not dispute this claim. Instead, Whitney included Dawson as one of the original nine at the River Ribble. While Whitney did not mention Dawson as the first female, he did add that Dawson's home served as the place for the organizing of the Preston branch and 27 confirmations, an account which was true. Without the confirmation in Dawson's home, the original baptisms would be null and void. In, con in conclusion, Anne Dawson's influence on the early church cannot be overstated. Clearly, her ministry in hospitality, housing, healing, church disciplinary councils, and both emigration and Preston retention affected both the early institutions of both the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Community of Christ. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Robin. Thank you so much for sharing your latest research on this fascinating woman in Community of Christ. Uh, I would bet that the majority of the people in the audience are not familiar with her name, let alone her fascinating story. So thank you for introducing and in some cases reintroducing Anne Dawson to us. Um, Barb, I do, I do just want to tell you, we do have one of her descendants on, on the chat right now. Um, uh, I invited him to come and it looks like he came 
Greg Sippel. He lives in Overland Park up in Missouri, and he's here with us right now. So that's fun having one of Anne's descendants with us. Very exciting. That definitely makes her history come alive. And welcome, Greg. We're so glad you're here. And I hate to draw this evening to a close. So again, thank you, Robin, for all of your research and for sharing it with us tonight. Also, a big thank you to Peter and Wendy for uh, your work behind the scenes and always making it look so easy. And lastly, we share our thanks to our dear friends in the audience for your love of a good story. And we certainly heard a good one tonight and for generously supporting the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation. Thank you, thank you. Now I encourage all of you to tune in next Thursday on November 21st as we welcome a familiar face to the fall lecture series. Lachlan Mackay will join us that night and he'll explore how Community of Christ members and leaders have had a complicated history with their history, sometimes embracing it, sometimes denying it, and sometimes doing both at the same time. The arrival of the New Mormon history movement in the second half of the 20th century challenged many foundational myth, myths, making the RLDS relationship with its past even more complex. It's been a long, slow, and at times painful process, but the first decades of the 21st century have seen significant progress made as the church finds ways to make peace with its past. So we'll welcome Lachlan uh, next Thursday, Welcome him to the fall lecture series and hear him explore all of those topics, all that history and more. We hope you will jo join us. So please be sure to follow the link that Wendy just dropped into the chat to register for Locke's lecture next Thursday. And until then, keep reading your church history, friends. Uh, take care and have a good night.